Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Fibbs, Director of Education in the Office for Equity and Diversity. Welcome to From Refugee to Citizen, the Hmong Journey from Rural History to Urban Experience, the fourth of the seven conversations that make up the Office for Equity and Diversity's Critical Conversations about Diversity and Justice series. The Critical Conversation series is co-sponsored by the University Libraries. Usually Jody Gray is here and I can point her out. She happens to be uh, off in Chicago right now, but she has done a lot of work um, helping create this series. And she's responsible for creating a list of further academic resources on each of the Critical Conversations topics, including this one, which you can link to on our Critical Conversations webpage. This is our third year of offering these conversations and we're excited to continue offering live streaming so that you can watch via our website in real time or at a later date since they will be archived on our Critical Conversations webpage. We've also added an opportunity for you to provide feedback on this series. If you signed in, we'll email you a link to the online evaluation or you may access that link again on the Critical Conversations webpage. As with all of our conversations, we'll start with some discussion among our panelists and moderator and then move out for Q&A in the audience. For today's conversation, I'm excited to introduce someone I work with frequently, my colleague, Joe Vali, uh, from the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence. Joe Val was born in Laos. He came to the United States of America at the age of 14. He currently serves as the Assistant Director of Engagement and Outreach at the Multicultural Center for Academic Excellence, we call it MK, and is a teaching specialist for the Youth Studies Program in the College of Human De Education and Human Development. Jova helped coordinate and develop the Hmong language program here at the University of Minnesota as well as the Vietnamese language program. He's worked here at the U since 1991. During these years, he served as academic advisor for the Martin Luther King Jr. program in the College of Liberal Arts, coordinator for the Asian Pacific American Learning Resource Center, and teaching specialist for the Ang Asian languages and literatures and youth studies departments. Jova is the co-founder of the Hmong Minnesota Student Association, the Hmong Alumni Association, the Hmong Men's Circle, uh, JMO Hmong, a living learning community, Vin Chow, formerly known as the Hmong Women's Support Group, and is currently the advisor for the Hmong Men's Circle. I don't know how he has time for more, but there's more. <laughs> he also serves on various committees here at the University of Minnesota and uh, other communities, including the Board of Directors for the Hope Community Academy, a charter school in St. Paul. Jova received his undergraduate and master's degrees from the University of Minnesota Twin Cities campus, and I just want to say we're very fortunate that he's able to lead us in this discussion. Please welcome Jova Lee. How many of you can understand that? <laughs> Some, okay. Hello everyone, thank you so very much for taking the time from your busy schedule to join us today. And we have four uh, leaders, educators from our community that they will share their personal and professional experience with you at, uh, as well. Again, my name is Njova Lee and I, I will be your moderator today. Uh, there are a couple of things that, about me. Um, I came here as a refugee with my family back in 1980. And um, I have two children that came to the University of Minnesota that just graduated last May, and the preachers, I'm really proud of that. Uh, but I still need to work on the other two, right? Um, <laughs> so let, let's, uh, let's find out from the audience, because when I see this, and then Bob, uh, thank you for, for Remind, reminding me about this, which is a keep me nervous about it. She said, you have at least 50 people here. <laughs> okay, so let's get to know the audience a little bit. How many of you know why the Hmong came to the United States? Please raise your hand, some of you. And we have prizes later on, there'll be cookies and other things, so <laughs> make sure that don't be shy. Uh, the Hmong look quiet, but we're definitely not shy or the other way around. I think some of, some of you probably agree with me on that one. Um, how many of you know a Hmong family, a Hmong, a Hmong refugee family? A few, okay. And how many of you work with a Hmong colleagues or co-worker? Okay. 
Thank you very much. And let's get to know Jovai at a personal level, right? Because before anything else, we want to make sure that we throw things out there and we don't, and you, uh, for number one, I speak five different languages. And by saying that, English is my fourth language. Okay, so that means that you're gonna hear that I speak English with an accent. If there's anything that was not clear, please raise your hand. Usually I'm not shy at all, and I, I would not be embarrassed. Uh, when I get really nervous, that's why I told Anne that I'd rather take this so that if I've got really nervous, I can hide behind the podium. Uh, I tend to speak very fast when I get nervous, okay? Or sometimes I pause when I can't think of anything. Okay, so don't, don't worry about that. Uh, so let's get to the topic today, and I really appreciate the, for the opportunity to uh, take part of this uh, conversation. First, I want to thank uh, the, our panelists uh, for taking the time from your busy schedule to join us today, and also to share with some of your personal and professional experience about Hmong refugees, uh, where we have been, <laughs> where we are going, all of those. And I have some questions to ask you later on, too. Uh, and also, second, I want to thank Anne, and uh, Anne is our educational uh, director, and thanks Anne for including uh, the Hmong with this important uh, conversation. Uh, I kind of waiting to see when the Hmong will be one of the topics, so today it is. Uh, and thank Clara for, for assisting us, and uh, Yia and Bai for helping me uh, try to get my nervous out of the way before I come to this session. So thank you so very much. As many of you already may have already known that most of the Hmong that came to the United States, we came through the refugee resettlement program. Some of the Hmong today, you probably think that they are uh, migrated from Canada, France, but originally from refugee camp in Thailand to another part of the world. There are very few those that they actually migrated to a, to a third world. And this is a personal, this is how I see the difference between immigrants immigration, immigrant and refugees. For refugees, we have no choice. We come here for survival. Otherwise, why would we pick Minnesota, right? <laughs> when we first came, and honestly, after, after what, 30 years here, I can say that. Uh, I remember my, seeing my father's face when we flew over the, the state of Minnesota in March 25, 1980. It's awesome. For those of you who live here during that time, you know that in March 20, 1980, there's a lot of snow. And my father was like, what are those white stuff on the ground? <laughs> and so uh, we came here for survival. We have no choice but to escape from our enemies. Uh, and then immigrants are to those that have the opportunity. They look for opportunity advancement and those sort of things. And that's how personally, that's how, it's, how I see it. So the first Hmong that arrived in the state of Minnesota as a refugee family came in 1976. Uh, and then the bigger wave, which is our, our time, I think most of my our friends and, and our leaders here in, in the 1980s. And then our last and most recent one, uh, 2004. Uh, and during this time, you can say that we all face different challenges and different experience in terms of adaptation and assimilation. According to the uh, 2010 US Census, uh, which is compiled by the Hmong American Partnership, uh, your director says my first cousin also. <laughs> uh, we have about 260,000 Hmong in America. California has the most, which is about 91,000. And then Minnesota holds the second, which is 66,000 or so. And then one in Vermont, believe it or not, we have one. <laughs> so that's the other piece that I hope that our leaders and educators will share with us today about, in particularly in the educational field, that with 66,000 in the state of Minnesota, we only have oh, about 700 here at the University of Minnesota. Okay, so in other words, if anyone from Office of the Mission, we need to do a better work, uh, job. So with further ado, I'd like to introduce our 
uh, panelists, and I'm gonna just gonna introduce their name and title. And then after that, they will introduce themselves. This way they can uh, share both their uh, personal and professional experience with everyone. And to start it first, uh, our senator uh, from her uh, Minnesota uh, legislature. So you can move to the table. We're gonna put you on the spot from now on. Yeah. And then second, we have uh, Ngo Nung Mua, who is a uh, doctorate student here at the University of Minnesota with the School of Social Work. And she also, she is also a research associate. Ngo Nung. And then our uh, executive director uh, for the Hong American Partnership, uh, I don't even know how to call it. I call you just by your, your professional name. Uh, Bao Wang, the uh, director there. She and I also have this family <laughs> relationship. Maybe I can share. Uh, she is actually uh, a daughter-in-law to me in our culture. And then we have Dr. Zhang Longxiong, who is the uh, associate professor here at the University of Minnesota uh, with the family social science. So I'm gonna ask the, the panelists to uh, take uh, maybe a few minutes to introduce yourself and share your, uh, to, to, with the audience. And then I have a few questions for you. And then as Anne said earlier, uh, we will give you a chance to ask any question that you may have about the, the Hmong refugee, anything in general, whether it's education, gender, uh, community involvement, whatever comes to your mind, okay? so. Uh, maybe I'll would, I would start with Dr. Jamblon since he is right here uh, next to me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, Jova, and thank you, Anne, for uh, coordinating uh, this event. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity for uh, professional and academia uh, alike uh, coming together and talk about uh, this very critical issues. Uh, my name is Jablong Shong, and I. Uh, often tell my students it's, it's very difficult. The first thing that you need to learn about me is I should pronounce my name. Uh, both are very difficult, Ja, which is a French J, uh, and Blanc, it's, a, it's basically you put belong and then you say it fast, Ja Blanc, and so you have my <laughs> name there. Um, so uh, I uh, a, uh, an associate professor from a very small department called Family Social Science, part of the College of Education, Human Development, and in, 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 uh, campus here. Uh, I came to uh, America back in 1982 uh, when I was 14 without any English, uh, came as refugee. Uh, that the few things that I could remember when I came here was the snow, right? Uh, you know, you came as refugee. Uh, none of those sponsors will prepare you for the snow. And back in 82 in February, a huge snowstorm. Uh, we got out from the airport uh, with a short and then a t-shirt and then a sandal <laughs> on. Boom, uh, right there's snow. And, and so the first thing that came to my mind was how did these Americans survive in this type of weather? <laughs> um, and here I am uh, surviving after 32 years uh, in, in, uh, in Minnesota. So. That's the first um, memories as a refugee. And then the second memory was really related to the education uh, component. So um, I was 14, and then uh, they decided, well, these refugees, we just uh, want to push them through, right? Uh, get them into uh, ESL and then push them through because uh, we don't want them to uh, stay or hang around too long. So they put me into an ESL class with a, a lot of other uh, Lao and Hmong students in there. Well, actually, just one Hmong and then many, many uh, Laos. In a small suburban school, uh, Rosemount, Minnesota, if you're familiar with that small town, um, very white. Uh, back then, it's about maybe 99.9% .9 white. <laughs> um, Beautiful teacher, ESL teacher, must be very young, 25, must get out of just college. I uh, didn't know what she was doing. And if she's there in the audience, I'm, I do apologize. <laughs> um, so as a 14-year-old, uh, you look at the teacher more than the classroom. <clears throat> um, and she was asking the 
this ESO students and I was among the group of uh, reading passages. It was one by one, so I was looking at my friends reading one by one, and I know it was going to be my turn, but I have no idea uh, what to do. And so when she called upon me, I looked at her with a big smile. I just um, said yes, but I didn't know what I was saying. So I would say yes, and she said go on, oh, beautiful uh, English words and phrases, but I have no idea what she was talking about. And that um, those, <clears throat> excuse me, those moments actually took a few minutes. And I turned to my Lao um, friend on my left and said, what the heck was she talking about? And she said, well, uh, he said she wanted you to read. And I said, this is my first day in school and I have no idea about um, what's going on and I have no uh, English skill. And then, of course, that um, conversation took place and then I was placed in a, uh, what today's call would be a special interventionist, right? Uh, a special ESL teacher would actually work with me one-on-one. -on -one. So, so those are the two moments uh, for a refugee, um, Minnesota weather, and Minnesota's teacher in classroom. Okay. And then, of course, I have done a lot of research um, over the years on uh, immigrants um, and refugees' adolescent development in the context of families and community. Uh, I've published widely on um, Monk Studies Journal, Journal of Psychology, um, Marriage and Family, uh, some of these journals. So um, you'll be more than happy to uh, take a look at my name. Uh, my daughter would say, if you want to know my father, you just go Google and type my father's name, and uh, his life is up there. So uh, please feel free to do so. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everybody doing? Good. Great. Uh, my name is Bao Wang, and it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you all. I want to thank uh, the University of Minnesota, the Planning Committee, uh, and Njova for extending a warm invitation uh, for me to be here with you all. Uh, I know that we also have our brothers and sisters from the Hmong community in the audience. So if I can just get a show of hands for uh, those of you that are born, born but grew up here. Born, born, grew up here. Okay, and how about our U.S. born Hmong brothers and sisters in the room? Okay, so about half and half. Um, so a little bit about myself. I came to America in 1979 with my family, and we are one of the very few families that actually land in Hawaii. Yoo-hoo, right? <laughs> so not here in Minnesota, but actually in Hawaii. And uh, when we uh, arrived in Hawaii, my aunt and uncle, who had actually gone there in 1976, told us that we have to save every single penny because we're moving to another state where the cottons fall from the sky. Of course, not having equivalent work for snow, right? So when I was in the refugee camp as a little girl, we would go outside of the refugee camp and we would be cotton workers. So I kept thinking to myself, so what do people would do with all these cottons that kept falling from the sky? Uh, and uh, I was always curious and asking my aunt lots of questions, and she just said, just be quiet. You won't, you, you know, I can't answer your question. You will find out when we move to Minnesota. <laughs> so 10 months later, we actually moved to Minnesota. And uh, when I was a little girl in the camp, you know, refugee camp, I had wanted so much to go to school. Because my brother would go to school in, you know, the white shirt and blue jeans, right? Blue pants, shorts. I think a lot of you guys might relate to that. And I would walk my brother to school every day and I would cry because I can't go. I, I was not allowed to go to school. I was the oldest girl. My brother's older than I am, but I'm the oldest girl. So I have to help out in the family. And then when we got to the United States, I cry every single day because I had to go to school. <laughs> so, <laughs> my father is just like, what's the matter with you? I said... I can't communicate with anybody, right? So it wasn't until we came to Minnesota that I started seeing a lot of Hmong people. Um, and so I was in classrooms with other Hmong kids and were able to converse and I'm able to learn. And that's when I really also start picking up, you know, my education. And so we've been, I've been here uh, since 1980 been in St. Paul, you know, all this time, you know, and recently just moved to. Hudson, not by my choice, um, <laughs> and I refuse to be a Wisconsin like, so I am still a Minnesotan. Um, so <laughs> I told my husband, I'm pretty sure you'll get sick and tired of the commute, so let's not change our residency yet. 
Um, on a professional level, um, I uh, attended uh, St. Paul Public School and graduated from Como, uh, which I think some of you may have, you know, also graduated from Como. Uh, then went on to the College of St. Catherine for my undergrad and Hamlin University for my graduate uh, degree. Uh, started my career out in the corporate sector as an auditor and then spent about 17 years working at various levels of the government. And about uh, seven and a half years ago, really felt that I wanted to feel more the impact of my work, uh, that I really want to contribute more to my community. And so when the opportunity at my organization became available, I jumped at it. And I can tell you this is the longest job I've ever had, seven and a half years uh, now and going on the eighth year. On the one hand, I feel like I just started my job not too long ago. And on the other hand, I feel like I've been at this job forever. So I'm a quick uh, summary just about myself, and I'm really um, pleased to be here with you all. It is so timely as we think about 2015 marking the 40th year, you know, since the war. So this is a very timely discussion and conversation, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gaonu Moa, and um, I've been telling people I have no idea why I'm at this conversation. I feel I, I was born raised in the U.S. Uh, in terms of accomplishments, I feel so like low on the totem pole. Um, but I feel very like humbled by this experience because I'm sitting with um, three leaders within the Hmong community. Um, they are, they've been role models for me. Um, and then all at the same time, I feel so privileged to be at this uh, table with these three individuals. And thank you to Jova um, for inviting me uh, to be part of this conversation. Um, as I said, I grew up, I was born and raised in a town called Missoula, Montana. And for those of you who um, don't know Missoula, Montana, and the history with um, the Hmong um, folks in Laos was that there was a connection between the CIA and smoke jumpers. And so um, the very first place that General Vang Pao actually was relocated was Missoula, Montana. Um, and so my family has been there since. Um, and I grew up in a fairly small community. Um, there were 60,000 people in Missoula, Montana. And then in the Hmong, the Hmong community spe specifically, there were about um, 30 families. So there were about 100, 150 people. Um, so in a fairly small community, and I was very fortunate. I, um, because it was such a small community, when the elders said, let's teach the kids Hmong, you know, every evening, that's what we did. We went to a building and they taught us Hmong language and culture. So I was very fortunate to have grown up in that kind of um, environment, in that kind of community where everyone knew each other. We, you know, go down to the market and we see each other. We, you know, it'd be rude not to say hello to another Hmong person. Um, and so when I graduated in 2009 with my master's in social work, I wanted to work with Hmong youth and families. And I've been um, on to works at St. Paul Public Schools. And she said, you want to work with Hmong people, come to St. Paul. So I came to St. Paul and I was like, wow, there's so many Hmong people everywhere. Um, I'm sure you had that similar experience. But then there were billboards in Hmong. There were stores with Hmong. And I... And it was so interesting to me that I could drive down the road and know how to read everything that was around me um, in both Hmong and in English. And so um, I just knew I wanted to work with Hmong folks. And so that's kind of been my career for the most part, has been working primarily with Hmong youth and Hmong families. I actually have a Hmong youth member that I worked with when she was in eighth grade, and now she's a freshman in college. And so it's so amazing to me to, to be both. And then I also have a mentor here in the audience, Dr. Peter Vang at St. Kate's. And so it's so interesting to me to see my, my role, and it ho has always been my role, is to be this bridge between sort of the elders and then um, and young people. Um, and so that has always been kind of my role as this mediator or negotiator. And um, I've, it, it's been such a privilege for me to be in that role. Um, I am currently a PhD student here at the University of Minnesota. I'm in the School of Social Work. I'm in my third year um, and getting ready to do prelims and um, hopefully be ABD by summer. Um, and my interest, my research interest, is looking at Hmong youth and oral traditions. 
Uh, Hmong, um, for those of you who are who don't know, Hmong have a very rich oral, um, very rich oral traditions in terms of storytelling, singing, uh, poetry, um, even sort of the everyday language that we use. And so, I'm really interested in how Hmong youth use that, um, and how and that role in Hmong in Hmong youth um, and in their lives. And so, I'm very happy to be here. And um, and again, thank you to Jova and and to Anne also for coordinating and inviting me here. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much for organizing this event and uh, uh, on the topic of transitioning be from agriculture to being a U.S. citizen. Um, I'm listening to my colleagues here, and I, I felt like I'm probably the more older member of the four and uh, probably the one that came a little early than the rest. Um, you know, I, I want to touch a little bit on the agriculture part, uh, the traditional agriculture, the true agri traditional slash and burnt agriculture of the Hmong community start 30 years before I was born. So, I mean, it was 30 years before I was born. So I was born in 1965. During that time, we were already inflicted by war already. Um, and I um, want to kind of talk a little bit about my life story here. Um, so I, I was born in Long, Long Chang, uh, the uh, uh, kind of like the uh, uh, clandestine operation of the uh, secret war. Uh, let's see, you know, if you notice the pop, all those popular uh, poster of Long Chang, um, I can see my house there, right? Right there, you know. So uh, I lived in Long Chang until I was five. So, you know, you frequently see battle going on pretty, you know, regularly. Gunfire happening regularly. Um, you know, see plane took off and, you know, um, on a mission quite regularly. Then when I was f five, then uh, my family, my parents moved to the capital city, Vientiane, when I was, uh, to, for me to go to school there, for me to go to school there. So, you know, that's one thing about, we talk at the, State capital about early childhood. You know, I I'm glad that we, I get to go to school in capital city of Laos, and my my Lao speaking ability actually quite fluent. Uh, I I'm I'm speaking Lao just like a native Lao. You know, I don't I don't use very often. I hardly bump into a Lao person. So I think everything that you learn when you're young age before ten, you you hold you keep keep that in very very well. So, um, you know, in relation to agriculture, every year I would visit my grandfather um, in the mountain. They live in more primitive lifestyle. Um, but I didn't really, you know, sweat until I, on, on farming until I get to a refugee camp. And you may wonder why farming in a refugee camp. I can elaborate that later on if some, someone asks me uh, that question. And then... Um, uh, Came to the United States in 1976. My family moved around a lot at the beginning. We first arrived to, in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then moved to Texas, and then to Kansas, where I graduated from college. Pretty much chasing after the relative, being, being close-knit society, being with the relative. So, you know, when you go to school, then you intermingle with outsider. But if you're back at home, then you're pretty much uh, speaking Hmong, go to Hmong church, everything. It's Hmong oriented, um, so that's pretty much. And pretty much now, even as a state legislator, you know, I, most of the time I end up speaking Hmong anyway because folks in my district call me, and my assistant has to be able to speak Hmong too. So, you know, it's it's still kind of similar experience. So uh, I pretty much live in the mid range of America until um, two th the early 2000 when I went to get my master's degree in applied science and technology. Uh, in Rochester, New York, um, and so I, uh, I'm a self-employed um, small business owner. In addition to serving at the Senate, um, I produce video for a living. And then let me see, uh, 2012, I uh, ran for office and been serving ever since. I serve in the uh, environmental committee, the jobs and agricultural committees, and health and humans. Service committee. So, um, yeah, and one thing I kind of skipped is I uh, moved to Minnesota because I kind of want to be part of the larger Hmong community. Um, 
and when I move up here, I give up my very well-paid computer uh, programmer job in Kansas and pr produce a Hmong TV, I guess the first Hmong TV program at that time through TPT. That was, you know, um, in back in 91, I felt, um, I felt, you know, very honored that I have the opportunity to um, be a pedestal to help move the Hmong community in, in the specific point in time. So let's, let, le let's leave it there, there for now. And also, um, while coming to the United States since 1976, I will have the ex experience to observe the transition of Hmong women's role. So if you want to get my perspective on that, I'd be happy to share with you too. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so very much. Now, for the sake of time, uh, I'm going to ask, I have two questions, general questions, but they're pretty uh, similar anyway. So I'm going to ask both of the questions, and if you can take, uh, I, I have my crickets here. So if, if the, the crickets goes off, that means that your time's up. Um, so I'll give you about four minutes, almost well, five, five minutes to respond to, to the questions. Okay, so the first question is, uh, Hmong refugees have been in the United States for over 30 years. In your experience and profession, what progress have you seen the Hmong community make in this area, this area of gender roles, education, social services, and politics? And the follow-up question would be, as a Hmong professional in regards to the future of the Hmong community, how do you see the Hmong community progressing in these areas? We can, whoever start, since you get a little break, you can start. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I will speak about issues that, um, that I have some experiences on, and particularly research and my uh, professional work. That, that would maybe um, put some statistics on the, the progress uh, that I've seen. And let me talk about education first. I think that's, um, uh, the, to me, it's, it's one of the most progressive areas uh, in our community uh, over the past uh, 30 plus years. So if you look at some of those uh, progression over the years, uh, the, the Hmong did not have a lot of opportunities back back in Laos, and particularly uh, women. Right? And so if you look at a lot of the survey back in the 80s conducted by my colleagues, both in um, California and Minnesota, uh, most of the data actually shows that about 50% of the uh, refugee men, Hmong refugee men, had about two years of Lao uh, education, so education in the Lao language. Okay. Uh, for a woman, about two percent. Uh, so it's very, uh, again, dis disparity between men and women, but the educational level is very uh, low. But then by 1990, um, that number actually jumped significantly. Uh, Three percent for a uh, woman, uh, seven percent for men, uh, for a uh, high school diploma or higher. And then by 2010, women actually closed the, uh, the gap, the achievement gap. 15% for women uh, having a bachelor degree or higher uh, versus men, which is 14%. Okay, on average uh, for Hmong, about 14.7%. So, so uh, here we are. I think one of the uh, very interesting uh, phenomenon that we have observed over the past um, 39 years, uh, women are actually making significant progress uh, in, in the educational realm, okay, and that's very impressive. If you also look at um, some of the principalship and a lot of educational leaders, uh, for example, we have about seven charter schools and both the Minneapolis and St. Paul public schools, most of the principals are actually women, 80% of them. 80% right? of the principals are actually women. Uh, so that's very impressive, and uh, if you also look at just the type of uh, organizations that are actually set up to mentor and inspire young women, uh, you see significantly um, number of those associations and clubs 
an organization is actually uh, institutionalized by women for our uh, young women. And I think the men have to do a better job uh, in, in that component. Now, um, you also look at, again, um, just the number of people who uh, go on into graduate school. Uh, that's also a phenomenon. Right? Uh, you have about 30% college attendance rate for women versus 23% college attendance rate for men. And um, women actually once get into the higher educational component, women continue to stay in there. Okay? So matriculation actually much higher for women uh, comparing to men. So um, education-wise, I think we have made a significant progress. Now let me just talk a little bit about the family, which is gender roles, uh, part of my uh, research that I've seen over the years. Uh, there's uh, significant changes in regarding to the idea of what it means to be a woman. Right? What it means to be a woman has changed uh, dramatically over the past uh, perhaps 10, 15 years. The idea of raising a daughter, which uh, in the past was really uh, raising a daughter to be a good daughter-in-law. Uh, now, it's completely the opposite. The idea of raising a daughter is it's really raising a daughter to be a self-sufficient individual. And, and that has been changing significantly in regarding to the day-to-day the -day practices. For example, the division of uh, labor in the household has shifted uh, dramatically because of that idea. And so now women no longer are in the kitchen. Uh, I have two daughters and then a son, uh, teenagers. Um, now, my mom and dad would come to my house, and they would say, my son, uh, cleaning up uh, the dishes and sweeping the, the floor. And they would say, well, sh what happened to the, the daughters? Why can't you teach the daughter? Because one day when they get married, uh, they are expected to do that. And I would tell my parents, mom and dad, 21st century, <laughs> uh, my son has to be able to uh, be independent because um, you never know. Maybe he could be uh, a guy who would never end up marrying, and he's happy by himself, and he has to be able to cook and clean. Right. So, so that, that whole idea has shifted uh, significantly. And, and I'm going to uh, maybe, um, what, the time okay. being, yeah, two I, minutes? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Maybe. Couple minutes. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 seconds in regarding to a poverty rate, and, and if you look at uh, Iran, for example, one of the most conservative uh, countries, but the divorce rate and their educational attainment for women are actually phenomenal. Now, uh, for Hmong, very similar, you see the same. When, you, when the educational level actually rise, uh, you also see the other uh, rates also rising. Same with divorce rate, which we'll talk about later on. And to me, it's not a bad thing. I think it's actually a good thing when you, you experience some of those uh, issues. Thank you. This is a very hard task, trying to answer two very large questions in five minutes, so um, I'm going to speak very fast. Um, I think in terms of gender roles, I do agree with Dr. Rambron that there's been some shift uh, where women now are looked upon to uh, be the decision maker for a family, which traditionally, you know, traditionally does not happen. And so although I'm not the, uh, you know, the oldest, I am the oldest daughter. And so you know, um, my example is a demonstration of the gender role uh, shift, where my parents are now coming to me. You know, we have extended relatives are coming to me for a decision, so on and so forth. Um, I think that we still have a long way to go in terms of gender role, um, because there's still that inequity. And I think that our boys are still very shelter. And you know, thank you, Dr. Jambon, for training your boy <laughs> to really doing a lot of the chores uh, that girls, you know, have been tasked with. But I think that girls grow up with the expectation for them to do a lot of housework. And, and because of that, they are also much more successful academically because they are able to, I think, focus better. They're able to multitask. Uh, so I think that in terms of gender role, you know, we have made significant progress. Uh, I've been able to sit at tables of clan leaders where, you know, maybe I'm maybe the only woman, and sometimes maybe there's a few of us. Um, I'm also, you know, proud to see around the country that 18 clan council now has women leadership, you know, at the table as well. So I think that we have made, you know, progress in that area. Um, in terms of education, um, I think that if you were to compare the Hmong people when we arrived here with no formal education to where we are today, it is something to be proud of. And that is significant accomplishment and success. 
However, if you think about where we are today, you know, we need to declare a state of long emergency to address educational disparities and gaps. When, in fact, only 14% of the Hmong population are able to have a, a, a bachelor degree or higher. Um, so what does that mean? It means that it's not my generation that is not making it. It's my children's generation who are US born children, you know, US born children that are not, not making it. So if we continue this trend with over 50% of the Hmong population being the, under the age of 18, that's a problem. It's not a good trend to have. And so when you look at St. Paul where our you know, high school dropout rate is probably about 16, 17%. Uh, but when you look at Fresno, uh, Minnesota, uh, California's number one Hmong population state, where dropout rate is 47%, that's not acceptable. You know, and so I think that we have a lot of work to do in the area of education. And we need to say, for foreign-born refugees who are able to obtain a high school diploma and then go on to obtain, you know, higher education, but yet our U.S.-born children are falling behind. We as a state and as a country is heading down the wrong path. And there's, there's you know, great work that we need to do there. In terms of... Social services, you know, I think that there's also been a lot of shift in the way that we provide services to meet the needs of the community. So earlier, there's a lot of Hmong refugees that were established to do refugee resettlement, resettlement type of work, right? However, we have not shifted in alignment with the changing needs of the community. And so as a result of that, about eight years ago, when we still have about 76 nonprofit organizations in the Hmong community throughout the country, where today we have less than a dozen standing, speaks to our inability to make that shift. Uh, because of the needs and the service and the, uh, the needs of the community continues to be more complex. And so if we don't develop our capacity, our skills, to move in, al to move in alignment with the changing needs of the community, you know, then uh, we put ourselves at our disposal or we're no longer uh, relevant, you know, to the community. So as, as we, you know, as a, um, in my job as a, a nonprofit organization, you know, I see a lot of challenges and barriers, and we continue to look at the type of social, social services that will move a community from poverty to self-sufficiency and to prosperity, and that will also move our community, you know, to um, you know, in, in, in more in the direction of, of equity. Um, in terms of politics, I think that we have made tremendous progress there as well as, you know, reflected in the number of elected officials that our state was able to produce, you know, here in Minnesota that are Hmong. Uh, we have tremendous gain with two uh, newly elected city councilmen uh, that has never been done uh, ever in the, in the history of Minnesota. So I think that we continue to make progress there, and I look forward to more progress in the future. In regards to, so the future of the Hmong community, what do you see um, our community progressing in these areas? Um, again, I think that our community should not be complacent and we should not be satisfied with the small progress that we have made. But it's really to say what is the data showing and what is the data telling us? And what do we need to do to make sure that we're on the map and to make sure that our number and statistics show up differently and show up more positively than they are showing today? We have the highest poverty you know, rate uh, in the country, uh, you know, within the uh, Asian you know, community. Uh, we have the lowest high, uh, education attainment. We have, you know, we have people that are not only in, you know, living in poverty, but dire poverty. And so when you think about how long we have been here as Hmong Americans, uh, these are issues that I think we need to be um, concerned about. And so what I see in the future is that when you think about education, gender roles, social services, or politics, is that there is a need to bring together uh, the collective wisdom and expertise of those of us that's in the room here. Because whatever issues that we have, it's not ethnic specific, but it's our collective problem. You know, and so I think that there's tremendous, you know, expertise and passion uh, for folks that work across different industries that can come together to say, you know, what is our data showing and how do we use that to start benchmarking where we are today and what we want to see Minnesota be in the next 10 to 20 to 40 years. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I don't have... 
much statistics. I have just my story that I'm going to be sharing, but I think it'll complement a lot of the information that's been shared. Um, for me, I, you know, I was born and raised here in the U.S., and so, um, and my parents came in 1980 and um, were resettled in Missoula, Montana, as I said earlier. Um, and always, my parents um, pushed education. They knew that for sure. My parents both did not go, were not educated in Laos, um, and so they knew that the one thing that they could um, help us with was to support us as we, um, in terms of school and um, academic activities and extracurricular activities. And so, um, and I also had my, my grandmother who lived with us. And she knew how important education was. Um, even as a, among women who never went uh, and was educated in her own country. Um, and so it was always this idea of go to school and come back and help your community. Um, and I think a lot of Hmong folks, maybe not, not even, not, maybe not all just Hmong folks too, but uh, I think a lot of people that come from communities where not a lot of people have gone to higher education have that, that similar story of go and come back. Um, and so for me, that was my, that was my story for a long time, was to go wherever it was, um, get my education, and come back and help my community. Um, and so I think of it as sort of reminiscent of like, um, back in Laos where families would send their, their sons and daughters to different villages for um, months out of the year and be educated and come back. And so, you know, I didn't go very far. I just went to my school down, this, down the road. But it was still that idea of my parents sending me off or my grandmother sending me off and saying, come back and help. And so, um, so part of me has been, I've been in that, that position of going and being educated and going and having these experiences and coming back and helping my community in some way. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I grew up with very strong women in my life. My mother was very outspoken. My grandmother was very outspoken. Um, and so I just became that person, like my mother and my grandmother. I won't admit it to them, but <laughs> I'll admit it to you guys uh, that I am exactly like my mother. Um, and so, uh, and so she was very outspoken in 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 my clan. I grew up in the Tao clan, and so, um, and the interesting thing about the clan that I grew up in, um, when they started putting together the family tree, they included the names of women um, in it too. And so, for a lot of family trees. Most times they just include men's names. Um, but we have these uncles who, who knew that it was important to maintain these women, their names, but also their clans. Um, and so we would know that our aunts were from the Moa clan or from the Yang clan. Um, and we would know who their relatives were. Um, and so and that is, that's been so important, especially in Hmong funerals, when you try to figure out how people are related or who to invite to the funeral. And so when my uncles started putting women's names down, you know, and they asked for my, when I asked my father, you know, the names of your daughters, I mean, that just sort of like opened my eyes to that there are ways that, um, that, Hmong culture is try, like adapting or trying to figure out ways to include women in these stories that we have. Um, I think in terms of the work that I've been doing mostly with Hmong youth um, is that, uh, and, and this is in terms also of the future, but looking at the ways that Hmong youth are recreating um, these dynamics that used to happen. And so um, for those of you who are on Facebook, there's this like Facebook um, page called like uh, Hmong stories and stuff. And like Hmong youth are like, totally engaged with Social media, that's how they're recreating these stories. I think like of my parents who, I grew up listening to bedtime stories from my parents and my grandmother. And Hmong youth are going, they're blogging about these stories that are happening, whether they're supernatural stories or, or like funny stories or fa stories that are happening in their lives. And so they're recreating these things um, that may not look like it used to look. It may not be the oral tradition. It may not be, you know, poto'u, right? It may be just the other day, right? So, but Hmong youth are telling stories, and I think that's a huge part of what it means to me. Uh, the Hmong experience is, is in terms of our, um, our storytelling. Um, but then also to look at, uh, you know, in terms of the ways that we talk about, um, I think a lot needs to be done in terms of the way that we talk about marriage and, and expectations because now more and more so we see more young gay and lesbian young people coming out. And I think um, the more that our culture can adapt to those 
um, the different ways that people want to be in partnered relationships. I think that'll change our oral traditions. That'll change the way that we tell stories. That'll change the way that you know our songs and chants work. Um, and so I think um, I think that's what the future will look like: is to be able to. Um, make culture more accessible, whether that's on social media or whether that's for people who have um, different um, gender identities or expressions or people who have different experience but want to, but still feel strongly connected to this Hmong identity. Thank you. I learned a lot from you three <laughs> just listening. So... Uh, I try not to go long so I can have more time to hear more from everybody, but uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the role of my, my, um, let me see, my uh, observation of the role among women through my, uh, basically use my mom as an example. But before I go, go to that story, I want to you know, share, you know, share with you a little bit with you about my self-evaluation and self-community eccentric evaluation about the Hmong school of thought or the way of thinking. I, I remember back when we first arrived in this country, there's two school of thought. One school of thought is like willing to share with people telling the story in publicly to mainstream. The more, you know, culturally school of thought is don't tell to anybody outside our community. Don't share any of our problem because if we let too many secret out, then we're in trouble, you know, we can't trust the, the, the at large. And I, as time go by, 30 years go by, I see that the, the, uh, the school of thought that are more progressive and the school of thought that wanting to share start growing. And we should re rely on this because we're living in modern day society. If we don't share our pain, we don't share our thoughts, we don't share our problem, then nobody else will be able to help us. So just want to point these two things that as a self observation uh, one thing that I found intriguing about, about um, I mean not intriguing but it's the Hmong experience is that uh, my mother uh, who is uh, illiterate and she you know uh, was a farm girl most Hmong are farm, farm girls uh, of, of their generation uh, being one of the more progressive family that came out of Laos were the probably the only one of the 48th Hmong family that, that have a house in the capital city. Now there's more. The Hmong that left behind that have more house in the capital city, but we were one of the 48. And to see that we're, my family are quite progressive at, at that time, my mom couldn't read and write. And she couldn't even drive a car. She uh, sat in the back of a motorcycle Every time she wanted to go somewhere, she would ask one of my uncle to drive to ride on a motorcycle, and she sit uh, sideways, kind of like the way British lady used to ride horses. Horses. So um, yeah. So um, and I don't know why she. We ran a pharmacy back in uh, one of the small town, and my mom was able to sell drugs, you know, modern day prescription. I, I probably just by identify the shape of pill, but you know I don't know how she worked on that. But when she arrived to uh, this country, she became a breadwinner of our uh, our family. Um, my dad had an accident and he can work, so uh, she has to go out and work and feed the family. And she wanted to learn how to drive for the first time. And when she wanted to drive, I know that our close knit community said, "Women can do that," you know. We never seen a Hmong woman drive drove before, you know. I, and I share I share this with some young Hmong student, and I thought I said your mother probably have a little transition, struggling learning, but it turned out to be their grandfather's parents, not so much about their parents. So you know, it was a struggle, and they my the the my mother generation has to fight in order to, for them to learn how to drive, get a drive license, and then get go to work. So that's, that's my um, sharing experience of the woman's role. I want to break down on the Hmong experience into three category, three, three timeline, uh, or three time bracket. Like the first 10 years that I observed the Hmong experience is pretty much adaptation. You know, I, I think Bao talked about it earlier. 
she moved from Hawaii. And the first 10 years of our Hmong experience since 1976 to 1986, we pretty much go north and south, east and west, searching for family, being trying to adapt, trying to find out what area is more, uh, provide more help, more assistance to us. So, you know, my family kind of go back and forth, Texas, South Dakota, Kansas, and that's pretty much the first 10 years of Hmong experience. Then they go on to the following 10 years, which is the uh, 20 years of our Hmong experience starts surfacing up. Our generation, my generation, graduating from college, we become the first doctor, the first lawyer, you know, the first, you know, carpenter, the first mechanic, the first farmers, and that's the first 20 years of our Hmong experience. And the 30 year is like we're coming and built a community together. You know, we start to have Hmong community in Frog Town, Hmong community in the East Side. That's when you start surfing, getting elected official, surfing things up. That's when Mimua first ran for state senate and Chua Leaf became the first uh, school board. You know, that's when we form a community and we want representation. And now we're at the juncture of 20, 40 years in this country. But our development is not as simple as I just described because there are many waves among immigrants coming in. You know, I would say outsider uh, 20 years ago, you know, when they claim to know about the Hmong community, they really know about the Hmong community because it's very simple. But now the Hmong community is so complex. I, I can't claim to know the Hmong community anymore. It's, you know, can't be an expert anymore. And pretty much, I think you need more analysis because there's different ways. You know, like as soon as we're gonna um, assimilate, the 80 wave came in. As soon as the eight group gonna assimilate, the 90th wave came in, and then the 2000 wave came in, and it kind of you know create that crust with the Hmong culture. Harder for people to understand what's going on now. If non Hmong people, if you, you know, it's harder for them to understand the Hmong dynamic within the Hmong community versus 20, 30 years ago, you know, it's easier. It's, the community is much smaller. And something that I would encourage, you know, maybe Dr. John Blong or other people, the anthropology community should continue to study our development. I know that, you know, back in the day when we were adapting, transition, we see documentary film or study about Hmong community, but now seems to be, I don't see much of that anymore because maybe we become more assimilated and then there's not that much of that um, unless there's students who are seeking for that identity, seeking to learn more, then there's, there's that interest group, but there has not been a dissect of the growth the, the dynamic, again, from the, your topic, agriculture to modernization. You know, I, I found it, in, even myself, even as a Hmong person, I found that quite intriguing too, you know, even as found my own heritage. So, yeah, pretty much it. I take more of my time, I think. Okay, thank you so very much. Um, <laughs> you know, I can relate it to Fong, talk about the driving things. Uh, my children asked me the same questions. How did grandpa get his driver's license when he doesn't read and write English? Uh, the Hmong has this way that we can share in the community. If you see a stop sign, that's number two. And so they share with everybody, so when you go to take the test, you see a stop sign, that's number two. And so they go, you know, after a few times, they get everything memorized in their past, right? And so that's how my, my father did it, uh, to pass his written test. So now we're going to turn to the audience and see if you have a question. And we'll come around and maybe by or another uh, volunteer will come around with the mic. And so now we have one right here. And let's see in the front. Hold on, hold on. I'm going to ask that you speak. Thank you. Thank you. What country do most Hmong people come from? That said, from two times before. Okay. I, I like to answer that question. question. I, I do like to answer that question because, well, uh, most most Hmong that are in Western country are you know, come, coming to this country through Laos, through Thailand, Laos, Southeast Asia. But majority of Hmong today are in China, if you round up the population-wise. Mm -hmm. And when I when I tell my Senate colleagues, you know, about that aspect, they didn't know. They didn't know that part. They all 
only relate Hmong to the connection to Southeast Asia conflict, the Vietnam War and all that. That's, you know, that's a good history, but we have a rich history going, we're actually China, I mean, we're Hmong, but as continental goal, we are citizen, origin of China, Chinese, yeah. Yeah, so while there like are about 260, 260 in, in the United, 260,000 in the United States, we estimated that about six to seven million in China. Go ahead. Okay, great. Talk about youth and social media. I'm, I'm updating everybody on Facebook and, and, and my friends are watching it live stream too. So one of them um, messaged me. Oh, that. okay. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Pader. Maybe you can share your name. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my so, name is Pader yeah. Bang, and I'm an assistant professor at St. Catherine University in the School of Social Work. And um, a friend of mine sent in a message uh, that she would like me to ask. <laughs> yeah. uh, and her name is Shoyi Tong. Um, Shoyi asks, are we as a community investing the resources, the funds, and the time to ensure our youth become successful? Hmm. That is an excellent question, and um, you heard me gave the statistics before. So we, we're a very young community, uh, and so when you think about our older generation of veterans, you know, our um, mothers and fathers who paved the way for us to be here, there's only 3% of them left. Um, but they do have a really far reach and command in the community in terms of influence. I think that speaks to why we're also successful when we uh, run campaigns and get people elected, right? But when you think about the disconnect, you know, with, uh, between the multi-generations, um, also our working professionals to our non-profit organizations, is that there is not enough attention and there isn't a plan on how we're going to really invest in the resources and also uh, close, you know, the gaps, some of the gaps that we're seeing, disparity gaps or, you know, uh, statistics that shows, um, you know, the number of kids uh, under the age of 25 that, uh, you know, are having problems with mental health and chemical health usage, right? So I think that there's a lot of issues in the community re uh, regarding our youth. And so I think that it's a, it's a collective effort. And um, I really challenge all of us in the community you know, to particularly the Hmong community, multi-generations, you know, to come together to really talk about this issue because it is a really big, broad issue that I think deserves, you know, a state of the Hmong emergency, you know, call to action. And so I think that with our clan leaders, they have a role to play in this. You know, and I think that we need to also involve our clan leaders, our working professional has a role to play in this, and, you know, and our youth. Uh, so that we don't have uh, a lost generation there. And I think that that's what we're going through right now, is that we have a lost generation, uh, or that identity crisis, uh, and also with the gender role shift, where uh, our girls are more accomplished, more successful. Uh, you can see in high leadership position, whether that's you know, in government sector or nonprofit sector or you know, private sector, you'll see that our girls excel at a very rapid pace in comparison to our boys. You know, and so um, that's also something that you know, has also been um, demoralizing you know, for, our, for our boys as well. So we need mentors positive form and your role models. You know, we really need to uh, get to our youth at a very early age, you know, and start building also strong self-identity and creating programs that would motivate and inspire them. And nothing can motivate and inspire them better than those of us, you know, from the Hmong community who've gone through the experience and who have battled, you know, uh, the many barriers and challenges to get to, to where we are today. So to answer the question, I would say all hands on deck. We are not doing enough, and we need to start doing something. Um, well, I certainly echo Bao's uh, comments, but I also uh, want to uh, allow us to think about this term, you know, we, you know, this is pronoun, and, and think about we. Who, who are we? Are we talking about we as the Hmong community, or are we as um, uh, institutions? that are just surrounding uh, the Hmong community. And I think I, I tend to believe the latter because we're actually living in a multicultural society and Hmong are, are not uh, aliens. They are uh, Americans, they're part of our institutions. And then 
uh, are we as institutions doing enough uh, capitalizing these resources to enhance our children's uh, chances? And I would say uh, maybe not because the problem is um, oftentimes institutions tend to lump the Hmong with the uh, larger group, Asian Americans. And when you do that, uh, when Hmong is very small, statistically, uh, Hmong become an outlier, right? And so, um, so our resources uh, tend to um, um, channel into uh, African American, Latino, or Native Americans. Whereas, if you disaggregate the data, Hmong actually suffer the most. And then I think we need to look at the uh, African Americans. Uh, uh, movement, mobilization, uh, procedure and strategies, uh, particularly in North Minneapolis, and how do they uh, work with uh, the cities and the county and the private sectors and trying to mobilize uh, everybody to look at uh, African American children. I think we should also do the same for Hmong uh, because it takes about, on average, uh, $10,000 to send a child to school versus uh, $68,000 to send a child behind bar. And when the child behind bars, it's not just uh, the Hmong's tax dollar, it's everybody's tax dollar. And I think it's actually a collective issue. So I think this is an issue that we need to have a collective solution for, for Hmong. And, and let's not isolate Hmong uh, to solve for Hmong's uh, issue and problems. I, 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 sorry, I kind of jump. I want to connect it to that because I, you know, trying to develop, you know, trying to put a bill and also make some amendment to a bill on developing a future workforce at the Senate. And uh, th there's a current bill now called the Pipeline Bill is a partnership between um, this pri private enterprise and you know public education and also um, uh, you know private you know with, with to to get some public experience. So um, I'm putting an amendment so that the it's open to all and be inclusive of all ethnic groups, so that minority population will have an edge in the pipeline bill. It's a training program where, let's say, 3M or um, General Mill uh, will work with UFM to get an apprenticeship. But I'm adding on the bill that they have to have a certain percentage of minority student to become employee of this big technology firm or big agricultural firm. Um, and uh, and health and health you know uh, industry, so that's something that I'm I'm doing on my part, and I think all of us has has a role um, in this society. If Minnesota get bet is better, then so as the Hmong community, you know. So, and I'll I'll just add that I think it's also important to engage young people in designing these programs. It's not so much as just putting dollars in it but as adults, but also engaging young people in the design of these programs and also in the research of these kinds of programs or services. And so I'd love to see more young people. I'd love to see this conversation in the community where young people can have access to it um, rather than it being so, so far away from young people. I mean, even for me, I, I got lost coming <laughs> here and you know had all these things. And so I'm, I wonder, like, for young people who want to be part of this conversation, how do we have, how do we engage them and make it so it's more accessible to those folks? Can, I'd like to take this opportunity to, to kind of give a little advice for young people so if they're pay, paying attention. You know, there's an old saying in, in Hmong, like, you know, like borrow the field to raise sheep. You know, like I would say this, this, this quote is almost obsolete. You know, it's like, you know, every year when we have new technology, it, Every two years, obsolete. You know, so it's time for young people, folks who, Hmong kid who are grew, born and raised in this country, have to take ownership of where you live. You know, clean up your neighborhood, get involved in your community. You know, we're no longer a transit society anymore. You know, and some still do transit, but we have to make sure that majority of our community are you know taking their active role in the community. You know, I. I am elected official of Hmong descent. You know, I mean, if you think about it, uh, I fit in the category of Hmong words that no, you know, meaning, you know, uh, elected official of public service or leaders, but you know, do we have a life? So to have a life is to participate. So I'm glad that somebody's texting you and I want to take this opportunity to advise them. 
you know, because if we, you know we had to participate in our neighborhood, you know, and get involved, run for office, serve in your district council, clean up your lake shore, clean up your neighborhood, you know. If if you don't do this, then you you can elect it as all elect the official as much as you can. You can have so many no, but we don't have name. So. Thank you. And then we have a question over here. Um, yeah. You can state your name as well. Hi. Okay, so my name is Chi Mo, and I'm a sophomore here at the U in the undergrad program. And so this is a question that we had in one of our HMSA um, workshop earlier in the year. And the question, it, it's a question, and I would like to hear your thoughts and perspective on it. And it's, it's asking, who is more Hmong between someone who is born Hmong and has and lives in the Hmong family but knows nothing about the Hmong family and the culture and how it works, and someone who is not Hmong but knows everything about Hmong and lives as among Hmong, Hmong people. And do you think that either one of those would be fully accepted into the Hmong community as you know it, of it today? Okay. And uh, HMSA stands for Hmong Minnesota Student Association. That's a, that's a very tough question. Uh, gee, um, I, I think we are in a uh, transitional stage. Well, we're moving from first and 1.5 generation now to uh, mostly second and beginning to see third generation. And so the idea of uh, what does it mean to be a Hmong or, you know, when we say Hmong, what do we mean? Uh, it's a very complicated one. And also you look at, uh, for example, Native Americans, one of the highest uh, interracial marriages uh, community. And what does it mean to be a Native American? Um, that's always been a controversial uh, discussion. And so I think we're going to face the same issue because interracial marriage also occurring significantly in our community. Uh, the acculturation rate, um, uh, non-biological um, uh, born uh, individual who actually uh, say that they're actually Hmong uh, and they actually learn more about the language and the culture uh, and they identify identify themselves as Hmong. And so uh, to me, I think uh, it's not either or. Uh, I think it's actually um, a, a sense of uh, self-identification. You know, if people feel a sense of belonging to this particular ethnic group, uh, whether it's Hmong or some, um, someone else uh, group, um, that's great uh, because uh, that's the future. You know, uh, we are not going to see uh, a more homogeneous uh, Hmong like in the past. Uh, now there's no such thing as a homogeneous Hmong. There's no monolithic Hmong. You know, we have about 27% Hmong who actually converted to Christianity. Now are, are they really Hmong? Because their practices are very different. Right? And now you have about uh, close to 17, 18% of our Hmong population who are now cannot understand any Hmong. Uh, especially with the younger generation, are they Hmong? Um, of course, if they identify themselves as Hmong, they are Hmong. Right? So, so I think it's, it's going to be one of our uh, 21st century challenges. You know, the research and immigration research are actually saying that by third generation, most immigrants will lose about 75% of their language. Now, we're actually now into second generation and we lose close to 50% of our language already, right? And so, so that's a challenge, uh, not just for Hmong, but for every generation uh, who are immigrants in America. And I think uh, we need to look at examples out there who could preserve the language like the Japanese or the Chinese, for example. Uh, and, and many of these ethnic groups, one of the differences between them and, uh, and us, Hmong, is that they continue to have a chain migration, that the migration continues. Hmong, uh, I don't think we're going to have this chain migration. 2006 may be the last uh, wave of uh, Hmong immigrants. And so we're going to face a very different challenge uh, comparing to a Chinese or some other ethnic group where they have uh, chain migration. I know that you all have a lot of questions, so uh, I'm not going to repeat what Dr. Jean Long said. I'm trying to keep it short so that we can, uh, you know, get more questions in. But I do agree uh, with Dr. Jean Long that, you know, who, who uh, what makes us small is really self-identification, you know. And um, I, I always remember what my dad, you know, taught me when I when we were growing up. 
Uh, when we were growing up, my dad says, do not be ashamed, you know, to speak your own language. You can run all you want, and you could try to pretend all you want that you're not Hmong, but you cannot run from the color of your skin and from your, you know, the way that you look. And so growing up in my household, my dad always, you know, tells us that, you know, you know for us, being Hmong means our language, our culture, you know, our traditional values, your rituals, and those are shape who we are as Hmong people. And so I wanted to say that with, uh, with the older generation that, you know, um, these, these things are, are uh, being lost and that there is a need uh, uh, to, for, for us to really preserve this as you think about, again, the 3% of the generation that's left. Who's the keeper of a lot of these cult uh, cultural values and, you know, the rituals and the history? So I think this is also an opportunity for us to say, how do we begin to preserve, you know, our journey and our history of, you know, all of that information really shape who we are as Hmong. And so I don't think that, you know, our third or fourth generation in the future are going to be less Hmong uh, just because they're not able to speak uh, the Hmong language. Uh, similarly to our brothers and sisters in China, uh, whom we have you know, not been to China in hundreds of years. And uh, although there's seven or eight million, you know, Hmong Chinese, uh, I could barely understand them, the few that speak Hmong, you know. And so does that make them any less Hmong than I am? I don't think so. You know, so it's really about our self-identification. One, one thing I just want to share and I found it interesting is that, uh, you know, Hmong tend to, I don't know, about this country, but those who were raised in Laos, uh, we seem to enjoy adapting other ethnic group. So, you know, a lot of us, I mean, a percent percentage of us are not, you know, 100% Hmong gene from China. You know, we're, you know, are, we are ad adopted, we adopting, adopted other ethnic group. So in just one generation, the Lao kid that we, the Lao kid that we adopted in Laos will become Hmong. The Chinese kid that we adopted in China will become Hmong, and the uh, the Thai kid that we adopt while we in Thai refugee camp will become Hmong. I, it doesn't. The adoption of Hmong parent doesn't happen in this country, but I know that in an old country, you know, like many of us had other ethnic gene, but we were adopted into Hmong family and become Hmong. We start to be. Um, let's see, a co-trade into the clan, Hmong clan system, Hmong family system, whether it's Tao, Li, and that, I guess that's one thing that identifies us is through our last name. Okay, thank you very much. Let, let's take one more question, and then we uh, need to wrap up. Okay, way in the back. Oh, hold on, oh, sir, on. sir, I'm going to just ask that you have to speak so we can catch, capture it. Thank you. Yes, you mentioned the uh, disparity in the success of women versus uh, uh, men in the Hmong community. Can you tell us why that has happened or happening? Could you also state your name, please? Vic Olson. Just retired. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's a great question. And I think that that's our Dr. Jamlong project. <laughs> I can only speak to my observation and my work uh, in, in the community. Uh, and again, I think that um, some of the contributing factors uh, to women's success or girl's success is the expectation, you know, from our, our parents. You know, so when you're born as a girl, I think that there's more expectation. Uh, you are expected to, to do uh, chores in the home. You're expected to, you know, do your homework. Uh, there's just more responsibility. And I think that our boys, um, and I'm just saying this from my observation, okay, boys? Uh, so don't give me a hard time. Uh, but, you know, like our boys are more sheltered. You know, boys are more sheltered because, you know, uh, they're, only the boys can carry on the clan's last name, not the girl. Once our girls are married, they belong to a different clan. So in order for our clan to exist, is that we need to have boys because the boys can, can then can carry on the clan name forever. So I think it is with the way that we raised our kids, uh, our boys, 
and you know uh, the, uh, the sh how how much we shelter you know our boys. And so I'm just giving some observation and example that, you know, I see like uh, many families where we do a lot of home visits and when we're in the home, you see the girls cooking and, you know, uh, doing chores work and doing their homework and you see the boys on video games, right? Um, so I think that because of that, our girls, you know, um, uh, you know it seems like there's, there's more um, skills that they have and so they tend to do better. And it seems like our girls are more ambitious as well. They're more ambitious. They have, they, have, they have a goal. They have a dream. They want to be someone. And you speak to our boys, they don't know what they want to do when they grow up. And recently, I was at a school. Um, I was asked to speak at a school. And, and these are, you know, senior students. And I said to the class, um, if you know what you, that you're going to go on to college, step to your right. If you're not going to go to college or if you don't know what you want to do yet, step to your left. 90% of the girls step to the right. And I would say about 80% of boys step to the left, right? So I think that this means that the boys grow up not, you know, even in, when they're a senior, really don't know what they're going to do, where our girls are much more focused. And so I think that, you know, we can talk about it anecdotally, you know, based on our observation, but there has not been hardcore data to support why our boys are lagging behind. I believe Dr. Jambong uh, is going to touch on that, and he's going to, you know, pull a group of people together to uh, undertake this project. Thank you for the challenge, Bao. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I think, again, it's a lot of uh, speculation and also based on uh, different uh, population studies. You know, the gender gap in education, it's not just a Hmong problem. It's actually every uh, ethnic group's uh, challenge. And so you, you could pull any data for any ethnic group, uh, you see the same disparity. It just happened that the Hmong's disparity is actually much larger. Okay. Um, to me, I think it's really about space. Um, do we, as, as, as a society, do we create space for Hmong boys to participate and be recognized and, and, and feel a sense of belonging? And so if you look at uh, space, uh, school space, uh, boys uh, in general are much more likely, if, if they're doing well, they're much more likely to participate in extracurricular activities. Do we have a space for Hmong boys uh, to be a part of extracurricular when they can't participate in football, if they can't participate in baseball or hockey? Uh, do we have alternative for these uh, young people? And I think we have to ask those uh, hard questions. I don't think we have. And so a lot of boys actually break away from uh, formal um, supportive extracurricular activities into informal non-supportive extracurricular activities like breakdance, car racing, uh, etc. These are not uh, the mainstream extracurricular activities. And so I think we have to think hard. Oh, uh, gang participation, for example, is really about sense of belonging. It's about space. Right? And so we just don't have space for, for boys. For girls, if you think about it, there's actually a lot of spaces that we created for, for girls, whether you're Hmong or you're not Hmong. You're more, they're much more likely to attach to a teacher. They're much more likely to feel a sense of belonging in school. They're much more likely to have a mentor at home or uh, their mom. Uh, Hmong fathers, and I blame myself for that as well, were very, very busy. Uh, we have a lot of what they call reciprocity. Right? I, I help you, you help me. And there's always a weekend uh, festivities in our community, and fathers are obligated to be a part of those uh, rituals. And when you have a lot of expectation and you live in what I call a global village or an, an urban village, right, there's so many Hmong, 60,000, and you have everybody is actually related to any, everybody in, in the Hmong community. And so um, what I would say is that when it comes to Saturday morning, you don't have to cook. Right? You just wait for a phone call because there's someone else actually cooking for you already. Yeah. And, and so that's the type of obligation out there, and fathers just don't have time uh, to mentor and to um, teach our young boys. And I think we have to do a better job of uh, getting fathers to be more involved and then maybe neutralize some of those uh, rituals and practices and trying to recreate a Hmong life in an urban village uh, so, so that uh, we could enhance um, boys' lives as well. And then uh, lastly, as I talked about earlier, 
the Hmong men or Hmong professionals need to do a better job. And I, I take blame for myself as well. And I, I want to thank uh, Bai and some other young people who are actually creating the Hmong men circle for our young, uh, young Hmong men. But we need more professional men who are very successful to replicate our, our uh, Hmong women's colleagues and how they're doing uh, in, in the community, creating those space for young people to be inspired uh, to uh, follow the footsteps. Um, I, just, I, I just really have a, a quick follow-up. When you talk about space and... Could you put the mic? Oh, a little closer. Um, and you talk about, you know, the, how well the we, young women do compared to men. But in my, as an African-American woman, um, I, I also wonder how, how much... What part does institutionalized racism play in this? In the classroom, when, we, when the, most of our students of color are taught by white teachers that um, there's a disconnect a lot of times, but the reality is it's easier for these teachers to relate to the w young women than the young men. That means black men, Hmong men, Latino, Native American men. I mean, so, I mean, I don't want to say that everything, it's all someone else's fault, but it is multi-layered, it is complex, and I think we really have to hammer that when we talk about the disparity in what goes on in our community. We have to talk about the full picture. Because, um, uh, you know, I, some, right, right now I wonder how the young male, young male feels after this session. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't heard a lot that, that I felt that I think would make them feel really good about they're here at the University of Minnesota, they're in their positions, they're, they're working as young male, as young Hmong males. I don't hear that. And you know what? Guess what? I was telling this young man, I said, if I closed my eyes, I would think I was at an African-American forum because these are the same things that are said in our forum. Okay, thank you. And then maybe, yeah, we need to wrap up, but if you can respond, kind of short response to that. And I, I think our city leaders, you know, start to get, have some awareness of that, and I've, I'm also fighting our hard to get out to, to help develop the, our future workforce. You know, in five, in the city of St. Paul right now, we have 75% minority. And in five, year, in five years, if the 75% are not reflected in the workforce, then we, we're not doing our job as state leaders or as city leaders. You know, then we're going to have mass poverty. You know, so the workforce has to reflect, and we're fighting hard. I mean, the door is closing quite tight, too. And I, I challenge this all the time that you have to open door to justify that. And so there had to be a, uh, equal or fair share The 75% of our community color need to be on the workforce. On a lighter note and about the gender role, you know, I have a chat with one of my Hmong, you know, uh, friends, female woman friend, and she asked me, like, well, the, the future Hmong depend on Hmong men, you know, the role, the, the, and I said, well, I suppose the future is depend on you guys because it seems like you, the Hmong women are more advanced than us men, you know. So it come down, we kind of come down that we had to find our mate. We had to find Hmong women need to find Hmong men to marry, you know. So that I don't know, I can I can deliver this quite clear, but I'm sure some some folks got it. <laughs> okay, that will wrap up our session, and thank you so very much, panels. Uh, and the audience, thank you for, you know, for coming in. Uh, and again, this is, a, this is a big, big issue and, and challenge in our community. So, you know, I wish that we have like, two days to, to talk about the issue and, and challenge in the Hmong community, but we'll definitely will continue this conversation in the future. So, again, thank you very much. And yes. drive safely. It will be warmer tomorrow. Joba, may I do a quick uh, announcement? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to let everybody know that um, on February 28th, we're going to be convening the first Hmong Ever Forum to really talk about, we're going to uh, discuss uh, the State of the Hmong Community Report. And so we extend the invitation to everybody uh, to attend that meeting because we're going to talk about where are we at today? You know, and what are the issues and challenges, you know, that uh, we're facing, similar to a lot of this, uh, the questions here. And the idea is that we would use this entire year to come up with a Hmong blueprint for the next 30 years. So I extend an invitation to you all. And if you're interested, please send me an email at baov 
at Hmong.org. Or you can go to Hmong American Partnership or HAP.org, uh, and I'm on there too. Thank you so much. Thank you.